Welcome everyone to another in the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy's uh, interview. Uh, as part of our interview series, we are very, very fortunate to be able to interview some of the uh, leading experts in the field of Cuban econo uh, economics, law, culture, and the like. And I am particularly delighted today to have with us, and, and again, um, extremely grateful to have with us uh, Jorge Dominguez. Uh, Jorge, now retired, was a Harvard professor for 46 years and Harvard's vice provost for international affairs for nine years, uh, among other senior positions. Uh, he's been publishing books and articles about Cuba for half a century, and all of us, to some extent or other, are his children. If I can, if I can allude to a Santeria term, nosotros somos sus hijos, que lo tenemos encabezado. We have him in our heads, um, and, for, and for which we remain eternally grateful. And indeed, in 1989, Abraham Lowenthal described him in foreign affairs as a dean of U.S. of U.S. Cubanologists. Uh, he retains that crown, at, at least as far as I'm concerned. His work remains amazing and amazingly useful. Um, his books touching on Cuba, without mentioning his excellent work on Mexico and other Latin American countries, includes the construction of democracy, lessons from practice and research. I, I like to throw that in anyway. It's a great book. Um, Between compliance and conflict, uh, East Asia, Latin America, and the new Pax Americana, the Cuban economy at the start of the 21st century, and democratic politics in Latin America and the Caribbean. And of course, his germinal work, which is the work that I still go back to, uh, Cuba, Order and Revolution, whose look at the way in which changing elites made claims to legitimate rule in Cuba and its consequences for their political system has substantial resonance for us in the US today. There's a lot to learn, not in Cuba, but for us. Uh, it will probably be as hard a set of lessons for us in the US as it has been for the Cubans, but uh, we'll see. Uh, our topic today is the most recent Cuban constitutional project that produced a revised constitution approved by popular plebiscite after a period of mass consultation and more intimate consultations within the Cuban Communist Party from about the time of the adoption by the PCC of its conceptualización del modelo económico y social cubano de, de desarrollo socialista, the Cuban socialist political economic model in 2017. And with that, this is the last you're going to hear from me. I'm, I've got a series of uh, questions for Jorge. And, and again, welcome. And I want to start with a, a, a kind of uh, a, a more intimate uh, question uh, for you. What is the most intriguing element for you in the new constitution? So first, let me say thank you, Larry, for uh, inviting me to do this and for hosting our conversation and obviously to the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy for having this uh, series of, of webinars. So to me, what is most interesting about the relatively new constitution, it's been in effect uh, for a bit over a year, uh, is that it's the first post-Fidel constitution. And that's not apparent if you start reading it at the beginning. At the beginning, you're hit pretty quickly by Article 5 that establishes the Communist Party as the only lawful party. Uh, it enshrines an authoritarian political system, and a lot of the Constitution is consistent with that. But if one manages to uh, get further into the text, the, the, this important post-Fidel element within the existing political regime appears in the new institutional design. So Fidel uh, put one title after another. He was president of the Council of State. He was president of the Council of Ministers. He was many things at the same time. <laughs> the new constitution explicitly prohibits that. The human being who is president of the Republic of Cuba, a new title created, has to be different from the human being who is the prime minister, uh, the head of the Council of Ministers. And in turn, there is a third person who is the president of the National Assembly, and it is that third person who is the president of the Council of State. Uh, and so, whereas Fidel had been 
uh, the head of the Council of State, the head of the Council of Ministers, and in effect, president of Cuba, you now have three people where there was only one. Uh, so to me, it's particularly interesting that at the heart of the new design is no more Fidels. This is not necessarily what one might expect if you hear all the celebrations of Fidel in Cuba's official publications, but that is the new design that they have in place. There's more to this. Let me just say one more example of the institutional change, uh, and then you know we can uh, chat about um, uh, any aspect of it. Uh, it had also been the case that many of the members of the Council of State, um, the, the institution most responsible for um, issuing rules, um, decree laws, as they're typically called, with full force of law, uh, had been full of members of the Council of Ministers. So it had not been just Fidel, but it had been all of these people who kept piling on titles onto each other. The new constitution makes it clear that the Council of Ministers, members, may not be members of the Council of State. And so what you have is a multiplication of roles where now many more people will have the right to have a say in the major decisions of state and government. And that really is very different from the Cuba under Fidel. Okay. Well, let me let me ask a, a devil's advocate question, if I may. Um, sure. What if I take the position and say, okay, Jorge, you're absolutely right. At least officially, we've now democratized the upper levels officially of the of the administrative structures of state. But at the end of the day, the buck still stops, as it always has stopped, with the first secretary of the Communist Party. And so might it be possible to take the position that, yeah, this is all state structure washing, which is, it's not really a term, but I'll, I'll try it. And that at the end of the day, there's actually very little substantive change going on as long as Raul or his successors have a lock on the position of first secretary. So uh, the key post, um remains uh, whatever title it, uh, there would be, whatever Raul Castro holds on to. And he has been the first secretary of the Communist Party and clearly the buck st stops there. He was born in 1931. He is even older than I am. Uh, the, there is a party Congress that has been convened for this coming month of April, just a few months away. One of the questions there is whether Raul, um, now age 89, will remain on that post, or I suspect more likely, will pass it on. And the most likely candidate to become first secretary is Diaz Canel, who is the president. Uh -huh. uh, and that would, you know, create that power link uh, at the top. But so you are right that there are, you know, there is this, still this core concentration. But let me suggest, because that's all that one can do, it's very difficult to demonstrate. Let me suggest how this new design in the Constitution may already have made a difference. So the Constitution is formally approved and um, uh, the winter of 2019 goes into effect. It takes a while to make the various changes. And so last December, um, December of 2019, the new prime minister, Marrero, is appointed. Marrero at the time had not been uh, even a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. He was not a member of the political bureau. Marrero had been for many years Minister of Tourism. The Minister of Tourism is the minister uh, that has the most frequent communications and work-related dealings with the Cuban private sector. And so the hypothesis upon his designation was, might this have an impact on 
the Cuban private sector. Uh -huh. What I observe at the beginning of 2020, before the pandemic, before the shutdown in Cuba and everywhere in the world, and before the more recent economic measures adopted this late summer and early fall, is that whenever Diaz Canela and Marrero would appear on television together or a meeting or a reporter in the newspapers, they would not be emphasizing the same points. Uh, Diaz Canel would always be emphasizing the role of state enterprises. Marrero, whenever his turn to speak would come in, would talk about various things, but repeatedly about the importance of the Cuban private sector and its contributions to the Cuban economy. Uh, mercifully, I'm not just telling this to you now, but I actually published a short uh, article in the spring that made this point, that their discourse, their speech making was not the same. A couple of possibilities, they're both plausible. One is a division of labor. If you and I were speaking, we might agree in advance to say, okay, Larry, you're gonna talk about this and I'm gonna talk about that. That doesn't mean there's a disagreement between us nor there needs to be a disagreement between Marrero and Diaz Canel. On the other hand, their experiences are different. Diaz Canel came through the party bureaucracy uh, and the government. Marrero's job has been the interface between the state and foreign companies and Cuban private sector. So I suspect that there's just a different experience, a different perspective. And so the suggestion is why did Cuba begin to adopt measures late this summer uh, that give new space, new political and economic space, new breathing room to the Cuban private sector? Well, you now have more human beings, more different roles at the top of the state. And just sheer number matters. And so could this have been enacted in late summer if Raul Castro had not agreed to? Of course not. But Raul Castro in the past has talked about the private sector in a constructive way. And now you finally had a prime minister who was prepared to say, hey, yeah, let's do it. So it is a possibility that this institutional change within a relatively short period of time admittedly helped enormously by the crisis provoked by the pandemic. They had to do something. But the combination of a new governing team and the crisis may have broken a logjam for which members of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy have been waiting for many years. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, you know, it's, so I, I think it, you know, the the it it may make a difference all right all right it, it'll be interesting to see in any case um one last point on this before we, we move on one of the most interesting things for me at least and, and i'm going to be sort of greedy because i got you here um and so i'll ask a, a question that of, of somewhat interest to me one of the most interesting things for me of the entire process was the way in which what appeared to be a new mode of engagement with either mass organizations or with popular constituencies, which one began to see with the consultation process of the in the lineamientos, um, and then again a little it, a little bit of a retreat, but you still saw it. Then appears to become institutionalized in the process of moving from the, uh, the, re the conceptualization of the state model to the actual process of negotiating the constitution itself, clearly under the leadership and subject to the veto of the party and its leaders, uh, and subject to the whims of the National Assembly of Popular Power, but still enough space um, with all the grumbling and, you know, and, and all of the usual stuff that goes on, but a space that wasn't there before. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, either that looms to be a permanent part of, China, of, of Cuban constitutionalism now right. and going forward. I can tell you that from the Chinese perspective, this just did not compute. 
the idea of actually doing it this way from the lineamientos on, and then of course in the constitution, would you, you, it not not Chinese Leninism? And so that's that, that's my question, sort of. In oh, Larry, very very good question. So let's between the two of us imagine a third person. The imagine Larry, devil's advocate. So the imagine Larry, devil's advocate, would say, look. They've been holding these pretend consultations for a long time, and they never matter. To me, what was noteworthy, because I actually agree with the point that you made in, in your question, not in the imagined devil's advocate, um, is that this time it did matter. Um, let me give you uh, a couple of examples of how I think it mattered. Um, perhaps the most notable it was an outcome I personally um, regret, uh, is when uh, various churches uh, uh, used the consultation to block uh, the formulation in the constitution that would say that a marriage is a relationship between two human beings, as opposed to just between a man and a woman. Um, you know, democracy has outcomes, and we know that in the United States that we may not always like. In this case, who knows how many Cubans actually oppose this, but during the consultation, this was by far the hot potato. Uh, and um, the government backed down. Uh, let me give you a, another example. Uh, I found it fascinating that among the many um, criticisms that surfaced during the consultation regarding the text was um, the most orthodox, the most conservative, uh, probably of the party members, who did not like that this was the first post-Fidel constitution. They did not like that the constitution establishes not only several roles, but imposes a term limit on the president. I hadn't mentioned that before. They, the, the, at the end of 10 years, Diaz-Canel, the incumbent, will have to step down. And presume. so that's a change as well. Uh, and they proposed during the consultation to remove term limits. And that's an example of the buck stops here. Raul Castro said, I did it for two terms. My brother evidently did it for too many more uh, than he should have, and we're going to stick with that. So in some respects, they listened to what seemed to be a loud complaint, and in others, they said, no, this is what we want to do. But it was interesting that they felt obligated, because of the process of the consultation, to report that there had been complaints about the term limits, and that they were choosing to ignore it. This is very different. They, they hadn't behaved this way before. So there was a substantive element to this consultation that was different from others in the past. Okay. Well, we can only hope to see how this develops. It's, it will certainly be a very, very distinct variation on, uh, on Leninism, uh, Caribbean Leninism, then, then you'll see either in Asia or in other places. So, uh, and, 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 and just to follow up, they, there's supposed to be another opportunity because there's supposed to be a public discussion of the new civil code. Oh, oh my and God. The right. question of marriage between a man and a woman or between two persons will come up again. again. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to follow. So let me follow up with that by asking you, what is the most disappointing gap in the constitutional reform process so far? So I thought the, the not just the constitution, but the process, including other um, legal instruments uh, like the electoral law, uh, is how, how reluctant they were uh, to make changes in their own electoral processes. Uh, let me give you an example of something that they could have done, they still could do, uh, although they've already enacted the electoral law that indicates this is not in the works, um, without modifying the political regime, but doing something different. 
The Cuban constitution authorizes the electoral law and the electoral law has different rules for elections at the local level and elections at the national level. At the local level, there is the requirement that for every post in the municipal assembly, they have to be at least two candidates. One will win, the other one will lose. At the national level, the same law says the number of candidates for deputy from a particular municipality or district must be identical to the number of seats to be filled. It would not be beyond imagination to say that the electoral law would now mandate at the national level, just as it does at the local level, that there must be two candidates for every deputy seat, and one of those candidates would win, the other candidate would lose. That is how it, um, um, they do it in Vietnam. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, the number of candidates uh, well exceeds uh, the number of posts to be filled. It's about two to one. Uh, and lots of candidates for deputy lose. Uh, and that is reported publicly. And it is an important different dynamic in the political system of what remains a single party authoritarian regime. This, this is entirely thinkable within the context of the existing Cuban political regime, but it would generate uh, a lot more dynamism. Another example that could be permitted. So now uh, those who are elected to these local or national parliaments are supposed to, they're obligated uh, to have what's called rendición de cuentas, to, mm -hmm. to go and meet with their constituents and report on the job that they did. Well, it's not impossible to allow them during the campaign before they are elected to actually campaign. Uh, that they could, miracle of miracles, be allowed to draft their own mini biography, which is made public. They might even be allowed to draft a paragraph that would say, if elected, I will try to do something to fix up the source in the district that sent me to the National Assembly. This is they uh, themselves, this is they themselves rather than being written by the local party organ. Precisely. Right oh, now, yeah. the only thing that is presented to the public is a biography that is written not by the candidate, but by the official authorities. Right. Uh, so this would be to say that there would be a biographer. It cannot be any longer than what is authorized, but now it would be drafted by the candidate. Wow. And the additional change that it's entirely possible is to say, and there could be in another 200 words, say, why did you decide to be a candidate? What would you do? What would you say? Um, even these modest, first of all, none of it is prohibited by the constitution, but it does require the electoral law to tweak and to say, let's give it a try. Let's, let's learn from different parts of Cuba's own electoral law and formulate something that's a little more open and a little more transparent. Mm -hmm. Are those sufficient changes that you or I or the members of ASCII would want? Well, of course not, but it would make a difference. Right, well, again, let me, let me be a, I, I should have worn red instead of green today. Let me be a, <laughs> a, a devil's advocate again. Um, I recall, and, and this goes to the, the inherent tension in what you've just suggested, in what I see as the inherent tension with the very firm grounding in, in Cuban Leninism that, um, that one saw emerge from the 1976 constitution as well with respect to the, the number of candidates and their personality as opposed to their instrumentality uh, for the, the greater progression of Cuba towards the communist society perfection. Um, which is bad English translation of the Spanish that was in my head, but, but you get the point. Right. In, in the 70s, Fidel took the position, and, and it, one that was really well in accord with the Leninism of the time, 
that the idea of having multiple candidates made no sense in the sense that the party would vet the person who serves as an instrument of the people for the qualities necessary for them to do their job, and that therefore the role of voting, according to this variant of Leninism, the, the, the purpose of voting, although they never did it, which is, which is why this, this just died, and they never had the courage to do it, it would follow naturally that if they did that and you voted, the purpose of the vote would be to vote the candidate up or down. That is for the masses to say, yes, party you chose well, or no party you did not choose well, choose someone else. They never did that, which is a failure of their own Leninist uh, ideology from the beginning. But is it possible to conceive of them going back to something like that, that is in lieu of something that begins to look more and more like bourgeois liberal democratic practice in election, to instead create a system that is quote unquote truer to 70s Leninism and say, look, we'll vet them, we'll put them up, but if they don't get 50.1% of the vote, then you've rejected the candidate and we have to go back to the drawing board. Right. So the 2019 constitution, that's the still relatively new constitution, now says that explicitly. You can only be elected a deputy or a delegate to a municipal assembly if you get 50% plus one. Um, that had not been so explicit in the past. Um, to your point about how Fidel's thought, and I think you're, you are describing it uh, uh, very well, um, he was compelled by circumstances. I, I don't think he had changed his substantive views uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the horrible experience of what officially in Cuba was called the special period in the early 90s when the economy crumbled. Um, to change the electoral law. Mm. Because under the 1976 electoral law, the entire process of selection for the National Assembly was indirect. Voters would vote only at the local level, and then the selection of deputies was in the hands of these municipal assemblies and the like. The 1993 electoral law, uh, the current electoral law is really very similar to that one, said no. From now on, um, a citizen will vote directly for National Assembly deputy. Uh, and ever since then, that has been the case. Uh, I realize not necessarily everyone who is listening to us uh, has a good sense of the Cuban uh, electoral law and how a Cuban would vote for this. So let me just take a moment. On the assumption that a number of members of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy might own some mutual funds or might own um, um, stock in a US publicly listed company. Uh, it's the same approach to voting. It's approval voting. Right. Uh, there is a single slate and you can vote for everybody or you can leave some of those blanks uh, you can, so you can vote for everybody, you can vote blank, you, if you're really angry, you annul your ballot, or you vote selectively. You vote for candidate A, but not for B, yes for C, but not for D, that kind of thing. That's how they do it. Uh, and at first, in the 1990s, it made very little difference. By now, this selective voting, I'm going to, I am going to vote for candidate A for deputy, but not for candidate B, it's almost a quarter of the national vote. That's a lot of people who are saying that candidate on the ballot is not going to get my support. No candidate for deputy has yet failed to reach the 50% plus one level, uh, but you now get people who are not very far from the possibility of being defeated. Wow. So again, these are, to some extent, you need two things. One is the, the change of the rules. And the other one is for people to say, hey, you know, I actually can make use of the rule that has changed. Uh, I'm not going to be punished 
by taking the additional 10 seconds to make sure that I am not going to mark the big circle for the united vote, el voto unido. Okay. And instead I'm going to take time to vote for Larry, but not for Jorge. Right. Right. Brilliant. Last little question on this point. To what extent um, has the new constitution transformed the formal relationship between the Communist Party as the vanguard leadership holder of political authority and the instru and the state and the state apparatus in terms of their relation, you know, that three-part relationship between the state apparatus, the party and its its own ideology, and then the people who they both are supposed to serve. So I think this is probably the part that uh matters the most to go back to one of your earlier questions the buck stops with the party um and that has changed the least hmm. so in advance of every meeting um where either the council of state or the national assembly are going to be debating some important new rule of piece of legislation uh you see it officially reported the communist party political mural met to discuss those rules. Um, almost as, I think, shameful, uh, perhaps even more so. The Council of State is supposed to issue decree laws right. only when the National Assembly is not in session. Uh, and you and I and anybody listening to us might imagine, okay, it would be at a round midpoint between one National Assembly meeting and the other because the Assembly is not meeting. What I find really shameful is that the Council of State sometimes meets the week before the National Assembly and issues a whole bunch of decree laws. Uh, the National Assembly then formally has to say, yep, they did a good thing but that they would not use their own National Assembly for the purpose of enacting laws, I find maybe not incredible because this has been done for a long time, but it really is an, a remarkable lack of imagination about making better use of their own instruments. No, 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 and exactly right. And especially since the, the National Assembly has not been known to have a history of substantial rebellion against the wishes or the leadership of, of these groups. Right, right, right. I mean, it, it would be another example of something they could do, it would make things better, is to have the commissions, the comisiones of the National Assembly meet at various times of the year. Mm. as opposed to just the 72 hours or so before a plenary meeting of the National Assembly. Then they would have the opportunity to do some investigating of their own, to do some follow-up meetings and the like. By compressing everything into the fewest number of dates and leaving to the Council of State to follow political bureau uh, leadership to enact uh, all of this legislation, they're not using their own tools. That's true, especially if after they've gone to the trouble of constructing this and convincing everyone that, that this makes sense. Right, exactly. They could. All right. All right. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't resist. So last little question on this. If that's the case, what are you what is your sense given this the thrust of the new constitution on the way in which the informal structures of power and the informal relationships between those who manage uh, and govern cuban society its politics economics and the like will change if they change at all so i think the the most important likely informal change thus far is that now in order to make decisions their own rules compel them to get not just Fidel in the room but a bunch of people in the room uh. and uh, you know before they all walk into the room and sign their names they have to talk to each other and they probably have to talk to their staff and to others so there has been a widening, back to your good question about public consultation. 
at the informal level at the top, there's been a widening of the circle of consultation. Uh, and I think the one consequence of that is they now listen more. And it could be just a suggestion, very hard to demonstrate, that some of the changes over the last few weeks that make new room for the private sector is because you now have more people in the room, more people listening, more people paying attention, and to say, hey, you know, this is something we ought to do. All right. All right. Excellent. All right. So here's a, let's switch topics a, a little bit for our, our last set of questions. And these revolve around the, what do you think are the, the salient changes in the constitution that pertain to the economy? Everyone, of course, this is the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy. And as we know, Marxist Leninist states equate politics and economics. It's all the same thing. And so at some point somewhere, the elephant in the room must be acknowledged. Yes. Uh, and so that's, that's the question for you. Okay, so just as I said that this um, is Cuba's first post-Fidel constitution, this one may be Cuba's first post-nationalist constitution. Um, the, and to me, the key to that statement uh, is if one, um, I'm going to mention the articles because I would invite those who are interested yeah. to take a peek. It's not very difficult. Uh, article 27 uh, through article 30 of the, of the Constitution. Um, the first one says that state enterprises are the heart and soul of the Cuban economy. They, they really are the ones that are supposed to do the job. Article 28 is the one that underlines this post-nationalist theme. Um, the, now the Constitution commits uh, to promote, promueve in Spanish, promueve what? Foreign investment. Not a word on the Cuban private sector. So there is a privileged role for state enterprises there is a privileged role for foreign firms, not for private Cuban firms. Mm. I, I find that construction stunning. You then go on to the others, you see that the tiny but dynamic entrepreneurial private sector, according to the constitution, is to be regulated. Not, there's no promueve there, there's no, you know, to be regulated and that property concentration uh, is also to be regulated. Uh, the, it, of all the things I had not expected in the constitution, this one ranks very high. Mm -hmm. uh, I sort of expected that there would be different human beings uh, doing different things at the top, but I really did not expect that foreign firms would receive this explicit preferential treatment in the constitution, that they might be doing it under the table, that they might be doing it in an <laughs> relationship. Okay, I, I may not like it, but I would understand it, but that they would formalize it into the constitution. Wow, did they not read um, you know, Fidel's defense and uh, um, uh, after the assault of the Moncala, uh, uh, did they not, you know, read uh, the language of the founding themes of the 1959-1960, the expropriation of foreign property? What was going through their heads when they drafted these four articles as they did? I find it extraordinary. Just extraordinary. Um, one of the things that, that I noticed in, in that context, and certainly since the, um, the conceptualization in 2017, was a movement away. And there was that, that moment between the lineamientos and the conceptualization where the Cuban government entertained the notion Vietnamese style, I won't say Chinese style, uh, but Vietnamese style, that markets could be efficient allocators or efficient 
efficient allocators of resources and a way to manage macroeconomic policy. But by 2017, that appears to be dead. And so if that's the case and they abhor markets, then it might make sense that in a, in a political society that rejects markets as either an ideology or a methodology, that they would necessarily also have to reject any kind of autonomous and privileged space for quote unquote private sector or the non-state sector. Uh, and, that, and that therefore, it, it would be acknowledged as a necessary thing, but only as an appendage. What was the language we all use as a complement to, right? And as, as an appendage of, and therefore not worthy of constitutional, it's worthy of constitutional acknowledgement, but not of constitutional duty or constitutional responsibility. Right. So, um, and you quite rightly, I mean, one of the, in, in a lot of the Cuban official discourse, there is the type of economic entity uh, uh, about which the leadership, to borrow from a very different context, dares not speak its name, uh, national private firms. Right. So it's the no estatales, the non-state, because just to say private firms is so ideologically traumatizing. So one mental experiment is suppose the work of the new constitution had been done, not when it was. Uh, it is the follow-up to uh, the party congress, which mm -hmm. is when, in effect, we now know in retrospect, the economic opening stopped. Uh, the leadership got scared after the Obama visit, had gone a little too well, and all of that, and it stopped. And so you get this, uh, a, a period of years when they kept imposing new restrictions on these little uh, uh, private uh, uh, economic activities and other difficulties. And it's in that context that not only non-market, but to borrow from how you put it, anti-market thinking that the new constitution is born. If it were done now, with Marrero as prime minister, advocating opening up new spaces for these, not just non-state enterprises, not just self-employment, but private firms, uh, to give them the full authority of a private firm under the Cuban uh, commercial code, uh, to make sure that they could export company to company without going through a state intermediary, which is what's still the case. Um, the constitution might have been written differently in these four articles. Um, but so that the, the intellectual policy, political milieu in which it was written was the most anti-market moment since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, you know, Fidel had clamped down in his last few years. Under Raul, you have the process you were describing. There's the lineamientos, and then there's the other documents and the like, and then boom, it stops in 2016, 2017. That's the moment when these articles get thought about and written. And, but it, to me, it's amazing, uh, nevertheless, that they did so. I mean, I just would not have, that, that they would hit hard on the private sector, perhaps I could see. Uh, it's the contrast between promoting private companies and just regulating uh, the, the domestic private sector that I thought was amazing. Right. But, but maybe the answer is in, the, in, the, in part of the answer that, that you gave to my prior question. And it was something that you said really struck me. And, and so I want to tease a little bit that for a second. In, in the course of answering the question, you, you, you came out with a, a statement that was just remarkably dead on. The Obama visit went a little too well. 
And then I was thinking, well, part of it, and, and you're right, so part of it is what we've been discussing, that the, the ideologues went anti-market, and then there's a bunch of the usual suspect ex explanations. But might the explanation also be the kernel of that in that statement of yours that the Obama visit went too well, and that the problem well, the private sector isn't as much an economics problem or an ideological problem, but a political one. And that if in fact you have open markets, you'll have markets ideology, you'll have greater connection with outsiders and political infection rather than economic infection, which might be, uh, which might be protected against by building these walls. And the best way of building these walls is to make sure that you have the state sector as the intermediary outside the national borders with any kind of interaction with the outside world that's necessary either to, to meet the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the periodic economic plans or in order to, to get cash. So that what we're really talking about is not economics in a sense, though we're using the language of economics, but we're talking politics. We're talking politics, yes. So one thought about this because it's the language of politics, but it's also the language of U.S.-Cuba relations. Uh, so domestic politics, but also um, U.S.-Cuba politics. Um, one long-term characteristic uh, is that the Cuban leadership, not only Fidel, but also his successors, have been better at managing the domestic politics of mm -hmm. austerity than the domestic politics of economic openness and prosperity. Invariably, whenever they, they open up and things are going well, they get politically scared, they clamp down. So I imagine in the top leadership, there, there must be conflicting feelings uh, about uh, US policy toward Cuba and its impact on the Cuban national private sector from the Trump administration. So on the one hand, it is true that as the Trump administration's regulations make it more difficult for you as visitors to go to Cuba, a wide variety of, of measures, uh, that it hurts the Cuban economy, but it disproportionately hurts the private sector. Mm -hmm. That's what really benefited from these U.S. visitors. Uh, the framework of U.S. policy toward tourism in Cuba is that tourism was prohibited. The definition of tourism was go to the beach. That was prohibited. So the U.S. visitors who could not go to Varadero would go to Havana. In Varadero, uh, the Canadians go to state enterprises and joint uh, firms uh, of, you know, the Melia Hotels. In Havana, they go to Airbnb yes. and they go to private uh, paladares uh, and the like. Uh, and so you could imagine at the top of the leadership, those who work on economics uh, would say, God, this is awful. And those who are managing the politics of posterity is perfect. We can ruin this domestic private sector that we have always hated and blame it on Donald Trump. Hallelujah. No, 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 exactly right. Exactly right. And, and from the American perspective, completely perverse, uh, because it moves them further from what they wanted, which is to foster regime change of one kind or another, and, and have really aided the, the government and the, because you're absolutely right. The one thing the Cuban government has been the best at is managing austerity. They cannot manage prosperity, but austerity, they've got that down. Yeah, and, I mean, and, if you are in the part of the regime or the communist party uh, that has feared all along that a opening to a private economy is a really bad thing politically for the kind of regime they want to sustain, uh, they thank the Trump administration. Right, and in that context, right, the Obama administration was, was far scarier for them. Well, a lot more That's why they were frightened. The, yeah. You know, it, the Obama visit and the Obama policy went too well. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> that was extraordinary. 
and the the very and, and one could tell by the very quick and very sharp response to the visit instantly uh all that talk was about a month uh i mean it was just amazing yeah well a uh, last set of questions i i know i i am uh I'm, I'm really burdening you with with these things and i really appreciate you taking the time uh to to, to answer the questions but so my my last question is future prospects. Where do you think this is all going? So um, it's a it's a it's 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 a good question at it at a time when it's difficult to answer. So right. one of the reasons you mentioned at the beginning that in addition to my work on Cuba, I had worked in other things. Well, among the reasons to work, there are various reasons to work in other things, but one of them was that Cuba, alas, could be boring. Not much happens for a long period of time. Might as well do something else. Uh, right now, it's not boring. Um, it's the impact of the pandemic. It's the impact of a, uh, an old leadership, Raul Castro's generation, Ramiro Valdez, Jose Ramon Machado, they're not going to be around much longer. Uh, there is a new team. There, there is now, they've created this institutional change that means more people have to be in the room. Uh, the, the pandemic healthcare crisis, the collapse of the economy that goes with their own decision to shut down the country to international tourism, all of this uh, means they have to try new stuff. Some of the new stuff is this opening to the private sector. Some of the new stuff is adopting, beginning to adopt, I sh to be, let's be more precise, a number of market using mechanisms and to try to see if they can do more of it than they have done in the past. Thus far, uh, they are doing some of this. This, this has not just been blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, and if they keep on doing it, um, by the time the party Congress meets in April, they will have a circumstance possibly not all that different than what it was when they last got scared, the Obama visit 2016, with the private domestic economy opening up and plausibly uh, Joe Biden as president. Uh, and they are going to have to decide. Uh, are they going to be scared again? Uh, are they going to seize the opportunity and see what they can do better? So that's what makes it difficult now because they are in a moment of turmoil and change and they have self-imposed a hard deadline. I thought they were going to take the excuse of the pandemic to postpone the party Congress. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and they now have announced the days publicly. It's the middle of April. I mean, they, this is a, a commitment device. Uh, and they did not have to commit themselves that way. Fidel, whenever he wanted, postponed meetings of the Party Congress all the time. Party Congress didn't meet between 1997 and 2011. Uh, right. That's a long stretch. Well, postponing it by a year wouldn't have been so hard. Yeah. No, they committed April 2021. Uh, so this is this is what the next few weeks, few months will be about. What do we do uh, if we have um, Biden as president, Harris as vice president, uh, um, Democrats controlling the House, Democrats perhaps controlling the U.S. Senate, and we, we, the Cuban leadership, just said the Cuban private sector is not the devil. Will the new lineamientos, will the amendments to the conceptualization, will the, um, you know, economic development plan to 2030, will they change? 
all of this has to be on the agenda of the party congress that's what the party congress is for well, the, the reason the party congress is worth following is that that's when they make these big decisions the last time in 2016 they decided to shut it down now they will need to revisit that question right and of course in the background the other elephant in the room is china's belt and road because the the cuba is always a rabbit looking for a hole and if they get scared the hole may not be retrenchment even if trump wins the hole may not be retrenchment the yeah. hole will be to embrace the belt and road initiative and become completely enmeshed in the macro the global macroeconomic world order that that china is is looking to build uh, uh, that, that's right that is one option they have it is an option they've had for a while right. and so what is interesting is that they have not yet taken it up and i think some of that is that cuba's relations with china for a variety of reasons have long been complicated right and in more recent years quite apart from the uh, ancient history um Part of what annoys them whenever Chinese officials visit is Chinese officials want Cuba to pay up what it owes yeah. China. <laughs> yeah. you just import vast quantities of stuff and supply very little. And you know, they don't want to have a nanny saying, come on, you've got to do better. You've got to fix your economy. And it's just so. Um, I think just psychologically, that yeah. has made it difficult for Cuban officials to say, let's embrace the Chinese. Right. Although they, they, they have been doing it, as I understand it, the way that they work the economics of the, um, of the medical advances uh, in fighting COVID with China involved fairly cut rate or free exportation of this technology to the Chinese. And so, yeah, it's a different economic model for them in terms of foreign relations. They've, they've been doing it. Um, they, they would like to post more Cuban healthcare personnel in rural China, where in fact they could do some good. The Chinese don't do quite so well for rural healthcare. Right, right. Um, the, but yes, the export of intellectual property, the export, uh, you know, those kinds of things uh, from the Cuban pharmaceutical sector and applied science sector, uh, those are things they, they are willing to do. They, they um, you know, Biopharma, which is the state enterprise giant to do this, is very interested in this and engages in these kinds of activities. Um, and China would be one way for them to do much more of it. Agreed, agreed. Any last words? No, but it's been fun chatting with you this way. Oh, and it's been fabulous. We really appreciate this. And, and on behalf of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy, we thank you for your time and for your thoughts. There is so much to chew on. And uh, we hope that uh, if we come knocking on your door again for some more uh, chatting, that, that uh, you will come join us again, uh, perhaps after the Party Congress. And, and perhaps after the Party Congress, right, yeah. And catch up. Again, so thank you very, very much. Uh, it's been great, and we'll do this again. Okay, bye-bye to you and to anyone who's viewing us. All right. Bye. Bye.